we need to hook up the rotary encoder. And my plan here is to keep it pretty simple. What I want to do is run a screw which has a diameter roughly the same as the encoder shaft down into the axle. And then I can shove a piece of hard tubing like vinyl or fuel line, something like that, over both of them. And that'll give me a pretty good connection with a little bit of play. The first step is to pull out the axle which is in there and that requires a little bit of doing but when we get it out you can see here the flat spots which I ground on it that allow those sort of set screws in the top to lock into it. After that we chuck it up in the lathe and get our center hole drilled. Then we fish around in the screw bin to find a screw which is roughly the size that we need. We pull our drill bit out and uh, run that hole down the center. I usually find tapping to be pretty enjoyable, and I think part of it is that it's it's a physical thing where you, you have to feel it, you know, and you can't overdo it. It requires a little bit of skill at least. So it's fun to run this one in here. But you can see what happened was that I hadn't really checked the diameter of the screw that I was going to use versus the the bolt. <laughs> because the, the usable sort of part of the inside of the bolt is quite a bit smaller, of course, because you need to leave room for the threads and then room to support that. So it broke right out. And, uh, and ruined it. So we're gonna make another one real quick. To avoid making the same mistake, I decided to first, before I do anything else, find the right size screw for this one. A quick montage takes care of reproducing the replacement, or I, sp I guess you should say it's producing the replacement. Since I'm gonna run this screw in all the way down into the blind hole, I use some electrical cleaner with the low residue factor to uh, blow out the chips from the bottom. Put a little Loctite on there, run it in by hand, and drop it on the furnace and kick the heat on to help it cure. A few minutes of heat like that, which also works pretty good for wood glue. You can put two things together and you put it on there at 150, 160 degrees and it cures pretty quickly. So then, then we cut it off here and file it down and uh, then we get the axle put back together in the main machine, which is a little bit of a trick, so I actually tape one of the washers in place. Later on I'll make this better, but for the moment it requires a little bit of effort. Now we're gonna shim up the encoder so it's at the right height. We use a few old business cards for that. And this, of course, demonstrates the problem, which is that since we went with the smaller screw, it's no longer the right size. What I ended up doing was just taking a three-quarter dowel of poplar I had laying around from some other project and turning it down in the lathe and uh, just running a hole down the center so it's a press fit on the shaft of the encoder. Put a few threads in the other one. It's good enough for now. We'll, we'll do an upgrade later. Next up is gearing down the stepper motor. It's currently at a four to one ratio between the, I guess, the rack gear that's on there and then the large one. And I've sort of since reconsidered the need for this gearing down, but in any case, what I did here was super glued. I mean, I scuffed it up and then I super glued uh, a 20 tooth and then a 60 tooth together, turned down an old bolt and made an axle that goes down the center of that. And we're going to use this to gear it down from the 4 to 1 current, an additional 3 to 1 to give us a 12 to 1 reduction. Unfortunately, in order to support this shaft, I realized that it was a bit too small for the bearing and I didn't want to use a larger shaft because it was going to be too thin on the smaller pulley. But before we get to that, the pulley I realized was actually, by, by the time you support the bearing, you support the shaft on the end with a bearing or something, they weren't going to be able to line up. So we checked it up really gently and just took a little bit off of, uh, of the end since there was quite a bit of room there for a set screw or something, which we're not going to use in this case because they only need to be coupled to each other. Then I found myself in the somewhat ironic position of having to use the foil tape strategy again. But it does work pretty well and you know, I don't mind occasionally. The reason we had to use it here, of course, was that if you make the shaft big enough, you, you can't make it big enough on the ends and smaller in the center and still be able to slide the pulleys over it. It just doesn't work. With that done, we get everything assembled and make a little block set up for it. Drop the bearings in there and get it mounted. I'm not generally a huge fan of belt drives, although timing belts are definitely better than normal. In this case though, belts are just so much more forgiving than gears or even chain drives. You know, chain drives have grease and things like that on them, although I guess you could leave it off. But the alignment doesn't have to be that perfect with a belt. You can adjust the tension, 
if it gets too much torque, it'll it'll skip on smaller ones like this, and uh, you know won't you don't have the potential of harming things as much. So it works for now. Hooking up the stepper motor for the upper arm will have to hold off till later because I don't have enough large gears or or small gears. I guess I just don't have enough gears in general. But it's going to use a belt like this, and it'll be back far enough so that it'll clear that counterweight swinging around. I do have the small pulley though, so we can work on getting that attached. The hole in it is not large enough to go over the shaft from the motor. And I had a problem before because I freehand drilled this and it didn't come out straight. So in this case I just used the lathe, I chucked it up very gently and drilled out that hole a bit larger. With the main hole straightened out, we need to add a spot for the set screw. And before what I did was I just eyeballed the drill bit size that I needed and it was way too tight. I had to make it bigger like three times. So in this case I, I got the went to the tap set, found a tap for the the uh, set screw, you know, looked in the diagram and used the correct drill bit. The block of wood is used to keep it vertical. I press that, I just pinch it between uh, forefinger and thumb in the right spot there, which is probably not fantastic on uh, drill press safety, but it keeps it vertical which would be pretty difficult otherwise, especially with that opening in the center. And being plastic and a pretty weak drill press, I wasn't too concerned about it. So we did that off camera, got the hole drilled, ran the tap through it, and uh, put, the, put the set screw in. I want to be able to test the motor's stall torque and other settings in real life. So I took this shaft here, which has a known distance between centers, and I weighed it to figure out the amount of torque that that's going to exert. And then it has a hole in the end so we can add load to it. With the main axis having its mechanical stuff set up and pretty well ready to go, we wanted to give it a test drive, but first we had to fix the other one to keep it from flopping around, and or not really flopping around, but just moving and, and bumping into things. Since it does have quite a bit of vertical travel, it can, can bump into the ceiling and uh, things like that. So we fixed that with some colorful blue tape. After that, we'll have a look at our basic electronics setup here. We have our main power supply, which is a 24 volts. That's for the motor. The motor likes to have 24 volts. And then I'm using the regular Arduino here, just because I have the most experience with it. Although you'll see in a second here that it's pretty well tied up when the eye opens. There, there was none open for a while. Now there's one because of something else. And so what I did was I picked up the Arduino Mega, which has 53, or at least 53 digital I.O. pins, and I'm going to use that later. The thing with that 24 volt supply, though, is that the Arduino and the other, you know, thinking components like to have 5 volts, so I thought I'd just use this little 5 volt regulator chip. But when you drop 19 volts, and even at 150 milliamps, you know, you're getting in the up towards 2 and 3 quarters of a watt there. That's a lot of heat to to let out through this small, small chip. So I had to put a heat sink on it, because I could feel the heat radiating off it when I leaned in to look at something one time. Another mistake that I made was to hook up the... I turned on the power supply and then I hooked up the alligator clips and it made a nice little arc across across that. And I don't know if it was strictly related to that incident, but these trans uh, resistors became very dark and I was having an issue. I thought it was these these resistors, but it turned out not to be, or at least their resistance is still still correct. I eventually solved the issue that I was having by replacing the decoder chip, the 2022 chip which was kind of a bummer because they're about $11 each, but that's why I bought two, because I know that I would need two of them later at a minimum, and then you have a, a backup in the meantime. Another lesson in the power supply department was with this unit. This is a power supply for model trains, which I had on hand, and since it goes from 0 to 14 volts, I'd been using it because it just seemed handy, a separate, separate unit to supply uh, lower voltages. But it turns out here, if you put it on the scope, that it starts off like that and then as you go up to the maximum it's it's just rectifying the current so maybe there was a capacitor in there that got fried or maybe it just doesn't have one at all but in any case that was uh <laughs> that was kind of surprising i didn't expect to see it quite that unregulated we'll take it apart though and see because this could be a handy little unit to have if we could sort that out you could remark the scale and just have a little variable voltage that's easy to change and you can change the direction as well.
The most noticeable thing on the test drive, of course, is that it's extremely loud. And at first I didn't pay much attention to this because I was just excited to see it work, which it was supposed to work the other day, but then we had this, this issue I had to sort out with the chip being fried. But uh, what I eventually settled on here was if you come around the back, you can see that this is just, it's just a box that's open in there. And not only is that box open and resonating, but it's sitting on this door table, which is sitting on top of steel legs. And that has been known to resonate pretty well and make noise. On top of a concrete floor, there's a big sheet metal garage door. So there's a lot of things to, reverber to uh, reflect that sound around. So to test how much noise the motor itself was actually making, we took it off there and just are gonna hold it in a hand and run it there. So I'd like to point out that I was using my good mic in both cases here, and I have the gain set on the same amount, and I haven't altered it afterwards either, so it's a good comparison. While I'm sure the motor could be driven in a better way to be smoother, it's clear that the bulk of the noise is not coming directly from it, and that some damping or mass loading could really help out. The other noticeable thing in the test is that there's quite a bit of backlash in the belt system, which is made worse by having two of them. But I'm prepared to deal with it for now. I'm not too concerned about it. One thing about it is that I do have that encoder mounted directly on the shaft, and this type of backlash is completely predictable. So if you know it's going to overshoot by, say, 5 degrees, you know, and it's going to settle at the end of that to, to a certain value, you can stop ahead of time and kind of work around that, which is not ideal, but this is the prototype, and I just want to get it working pretty good, say 80% of, of the ideal. A final note on the power supply is constant current versus constant voltage. We were pretty well stumped on this one evening because it kept hitting the constant current limit, and I thought, oh no, I don't want to fry this thing, so I kept cranking it down, and then, of course, it kept hitting it again. So to anyone out there who's not aware, constant current does not mean that it will put out a constant current. It means that that's what it's going to limit it to would be the better the better phrase, the, the current limit. I also determined on this motor driver, which I had bought with the help of a, a forum discussion also, that the, the uh, switch diagram for the excitation mode is backwards. So you'll, you'll see here that it's on the uh, two micro steps or whatever per thing. And you have, to, you have to put everything backwards to the diagram, whereas all the other ones are correct. So that was also confusing initially. In the chip department, things went pretty smoothly. I had gone through the data sheet for that decoder chip very carefully, made up my own pinout diagram with terms that made sense to me without having to think too hard. And I basically just wired it up and with a little bit of troubleshooting was able to get it to work. One thing that's an issue though is that it needs an external clock line and I was using the Arduino's PWM output, which is on some of the pins is 490 hertz, and you need three pulses per signal that comes in from the rotary encoder. So if you're pulling in, like in this case, I've been getting 2400, even though it's supposed to be a 600 pulse one, I was getting 1200 before using interrupts, which I think may, which I was attributing to doing rising and lowering but I think that may not be correct. I think it may actually be a 1200. Maybe it was just mislabeled because I've been getting 2400 lately. So in any case, if you're going to do 2400 pulses per revolution and you need three clock signals per pulse, you need a lot of pulses. So I have that 555 chip there off to the side, which is providing a, instead of a 490 hertz signal from the Arduino, a 125 kilohertz line which is which is much better and then the trim pod is just adjusting it so it's reasonably close to 50 percent duty cycle now i realize that you can go in and do all sorts of funny things in the arduino to modify the internal timers but i felt that i should probably avoid that right now because it seems like the sort of thing that will work okay right now and then later it will cause some sort of strange error and it'll take me a really long time to track down and be very frustrating so i'm going to head it off and gain a little experience with separate ICs by wiring that up and, and getting it dialed in. I also got another small toy in the mail, which is a live center for the lathe and a proper parting tool for it also. I've been using a hacksaw lately <laughs> to part tools off, which does the job, but it's uh, not especially accurate and it's not 
fantastic on the safety thing either. So this one will be much better. Thank you for watching, and we'll be back next week.